Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for being here uh, for our second day. Thanks for being here prompt and early. I hope you had some thought-provoking and engaged conversations over dinner last night. I also hope you had a good restful night's sleep. I heard a couple of reports of some nice walks on the beach, so I hope you're enjoying the, the context here. Uh, in the spirit of this being a conversation, we've envisioned this morning session as a very interactive one. Uh, our discussions are going to be focusing on stories or strategies for rethinking our syllabi, our, our pedagogy, our scholarship, our disciplines, uh, our overall curriculum in order to be more inclusive. Uh, in fact, we've entitled this session Inclusive Teaching and Learning, and we've asked four Westmont faculty members to be catalysts for conversations which are going to be around the, your tables. Uh, these catalysts will share things that they have done that they think have worked, some things that they will be attempting to do, and some things that they've tried that uh, failed. Uh, and out of that record of reimagining and struggle, we hope there are some good prompts for dialogues around your table and how your courses can be more inclusive, uh, both in terms of the learning communities that we create and in terms of the content that we explore in those courses. There will be four uh, discussion sessions uh, with about 12 minutes each for each uh, session around your table. It's going to be a tight schedule, I'll admit right from the beginning, because we have to end right at 10:15 sharp in order to allow sufficient time to get down to um, our, our gymnasium for the chapel with uh, Reggie Williams uh, uh, at 10:30. 12 minutes goes by quickly, so my job will be to keep us moving, which means I will be interrupting a lot of really good conversation and cutting it short and trying to keep the traffic flowing uh, like it's trying to keep the traffic flowing on the 405. Okay. So the format's simple. We'll have a brief report from a faculty member. Right after that, I'll give you a prompt question to kickstart the conversation, but your table can go any direction you want in response to the, um, uh, the catalyst. Um, we, we ask that uh, you try to maintain an inclusive spirit uh, at the table and try to find opportunities for as many voices to get in the conversation during this, this morning as possible and not let one or two voices dominate. Uh, we don't think we need moderators. We've done this before. It works well. You're all creative, energetic, have great ideas. So we ask that you share your, your time together. It looks like all the tables are pretty full. Uh, for those of you in the back, I think there are some seats that uh, you can grab if you want to grab an extra chair or two to make uh, an extra member of the table, please do. But uh, we, we want you to feel uh, a part of the community uh, discussion. Our first prompt is going to come from uh, Dr. Lisa DeBoer, who is a professor of art history at Westmont. Uh, Lisa is an expert on the uh, Dutch Renaissance and the author of an award-winning book entitled Visual Arts in the Worshiping Church. Lisa. My comments this morning will focus on what to do with canonicity in lower division art history surveys. It's useful to know that I'm the only art historian on campus, so these choices are entirely mine to make. The dominant approach to this question, represented in all the major textbooks, has been to sprinkle the non-Western material throughout the Western material, interrupting the standard story with the chronologically adjacent non-Western material. With some trepidation, I've rejected this approach for two reasons. <laughs> Impressionistic voice, I guess. Uh, first, even when done with sophistication and skill on the part of the professor, new learners in the discipline are likely to take away only a tokenized understanding of the non-Western material, because the proportion of Western to non-Western material is not close to being actually proportional. Second, and more importantly for me, the non-Western material requires a range of different methods and different analytical categories, which are impossible to properly introduce when dealing with so little material at such a pace. It's hard enough at the introductory level to help students appreciate the historiographic and methodological issues that created a dominant Western canon, which in turn creates the category of non-Western art. I've chosen to teach a course on world art, which tackles head-on the very categories of Western and non-Western. So while learning about the arts of the rest of the world, we also compare the typologies, the histories, and the methods used within a different range of art systems and contrast them to Western habits of viewing and analysis in order to recognize how peculiar, how recent, and how limited Western art with a capital A actually is, and correspondingly how rich, vast, and active 
The art of the rest of the world is by way of contrast. Teaching world art has transformed how I teach the Western Survey. Like Art 23, my world art class, the Western Survey is much as much about how we came to tell the standard story as it is about the content of that story. I highlight the tensions, the paradoxes, and the imaginedness of the Western tradition. Why does ancient Egyptian art end up in the Western Survey when African art doesn't? Why does the art of Asia Minor figure only until around 600 AD? Why do so many descriptors for stylistic movements begin as terms of abuse? Gothic, Romanesque, Baroque, Impressionist, Fauve. How does the training of artists in the West from at least the 1500s invent, reproduce, and sustain the standard story? At every opportunity, students are invited to notice what the standards are that lead to the judgments, the assumptions, the norms about what constitutes truly worthy art in the Western tradition, and who's calling those shots, who gets to be in, who is perceived as out, and what the lasting consequences of these assumptions and judgments might be. They're also invited to ponder how such tacit norms and assumptions and the analytical moves and categories of praise and blame that result might be familiar to them from other areas of their lives. It's easier for students to grasp what is at stake in constructing a history when we're dealing with that major history, an imagined one, and its perceived others. I realize the weakness of my choices. I think both the standard textbook approach and my approach are compromised, but at this point, I will live with the second set of compromises rather than the first. Thank you, Lisa. So in your discussions, you can respond to any of that. It may pr prompt some um, reflections on parallel situations. But here, here's a question if you want to use it as a, as a jumping off point, and that is to share uh, a strategy for how you would enable a community of learners to, to discern and analyze the, uh, the assumptions behind the construction of any syllabus. Okay. Uh, enjoy about 12 minutes to talk. I warned you that my primary job was to cut off a lot of good conversation mid-course, so uh, good to hear a lot of conversation, but we're going to move on to our second prompt, and that is going to be given to us by Dr. Chandra Malampali, who's Professor of History and currently the Fletcher Jones Endowed Chair in the Social Sciences at Westmont. He's an expert on law and religion and history and colonialism in, in India. And he has two recent books from Cambridge University Press. So, uh, Dr. Chandra Malampali, thank you. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, fresh off the heels of my lecture on the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> give you an idea of one way I tried to be centered uh, written in the story of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, most people who come to uh, my world history course have had some exposure to the Industrial Revolution. But uh, they have what I call the narrative of the Immaculate Conception. That is, uh, that the Industrial Revolution arises as a type of an autonomous history that is far removed from what's going on in other parts of the world. And so the decentering work happens by drawing attention to a particular aspect of the IR relating to the production of cotton and the development of these machines at the end of the 18th, at the end of the 18th century. Where was the center of cotton production prior to the advent of the loom and the spinning jenny and the steam power loom? It was South Asia. So a million weavers were put out of business uh, from West Bengal with the advent of the uh, Industrial Revolution. And so I divert attention to the old cotton system. Uh, the old cotton system that thrived for millennia where Indians were producing these outstanding textiles that the rest of the world wanted throughout the Indian Ocean, but also in Europe. British people coveted Indian cottons and um, were not able to stimulate the quality of the product. And so where does innovation come from? It comes from necessity. It doesn't come from work ethic, rationality, individualism, all the virtues associated with European essentialism. It comes from contingencies that compel the innovation and in this case, it was competition with another part of the world that was almost impossible to overcome until the right inventions happen, happen at the right time. But the right inventions don't simply produce more cotton. Um, if it was just quantity that compelled the invention, um, I mean, you could have produced a bunch of rotten cotton 
So it was a competition to produce the quality um, and, the left, and the versatility so that you can market it to um, African populations, market it to the new world, market it to um, different social classes. So this is part of the work of, of decentering. The last thing I would say about decentering is that decentering is not hate. Decentering a story is not saying that there is no authentic genius associated with the story of Isambard, Kingdom Brunel, and other Edmund Cartwright, and Mark Greaves. And, uh, decentering is just telling a rounded out picture uh, and understanding that the world is organically connected to each other. Okay. Thank you, Chandra. Uh, a lot to think about there. Here's a, here's a quick prompt. I think it'd be helpful to share with one another. Um, where you've seen the need to do some decentering or rounding out, to, to, to use your image in your own classes. And if you're a student, uh, where you'd wish the professor had done a little more decentering or rounding out. So where have you done it? Uh, where have you wished it to be? Enjoy. All right, I'm going to move us on to our third session. And our third uh, faculty member to uh, provide a prompt for us or a catalyst for us is is Dr. Rebecca McNamara, who is a uh, assistant professor of English at Westmont. Uh, she is uh, an expert on Eng uh, English medieval literature and has a real interest in, in mental health, uh, both in the, um, as it's reflected in the literature of the, of the medieval period, but also she's, she's worked as a junior dean at Oxford uh, in student life issues, and so she's worked a lot with contemporary students as well. So, uh, Rebecca? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm a medievalist. I teach Middle English literature, and um, I found it challenging to work in um, questions about race and identity in ways that aren't tokenizing. So I found out about a story collection called the Refugee Tales. It's actually inspired by um, chocolate and Canterbury Tales, um, and it's it's a project as well as a short story collection meant to draw attention to the practice of indefinite detention of asylum seekers in the UK. Um, so I designed the course around this book. We start with that book and then we read uh, six or seven other texts all by men and women of color and all that have central themes of um, race and displacement and identity. Um, I, I taught it once three years ago and I'm teaching it for the second time currently. And I'm gonna talk about three things that I've sort of shifted, um, things that like didn't work or I've revised. Um, so one of those things is that I was trying the first time around to get, I'm, teaching literature, and I wanted students to focus on the form, so um, the literary, the rhetorical aspects of these texts, because they're all very accomplished, and I love teaching that kind of stuff, but students found it very difficult to engage with those formal questions when they really desired to dive into the thematic um, and theoretical issues around race, which we were doing in class discussion, but they found it hard to write, for example, a close reading essay. Um, so I've actually cut the close reading ex essay exercise for this time around, and we only, um, in their papers, focus on theoretical and um, thematic questions, so it's given them more space to process that. Um, second is that I've realized they need a lot more scaffolding than I thought they did um, to talk about these issues. And so this is an upper level class, um, but I'm having to bring in so much secondary reading just for them to have vocabulary um, around this. So I bring in a lot of um, work from critical race studies and social psychology, just so they literally have the vocabulary to discuss, for example, the difference between race and ethnicity, which we literally discussed yesterday in this class, um, and then apply it to the novel that we're reading. Um, and then third is that I realize that these students need time to process these texts personally during class, not just on their own. Um, and part of that is because these are basically it's all refugee literature, and it's really hard um, emotionally. And so I provide space in class for them to do that. Um, we do some of that work in group discussion, or I might break them into partners and say, talk about a time when you have felt displaced, um, and how does, how does this novel kind of bring that up for you? Um, and then we don't come back and share it all together, so they've had sort of a semi-private moment to do some processing um, with their classmate, and it builds a better community within the class as well. Um, but then, like I said, we do that in group discussion too. So I've worked in a lot more of that um, this time around. Okay. Those are my three takeaways. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, a prompt that comes out of that is: Can you uh, recall or imagine context in which uh, individuals, students, and faculty need to do some 
some processing, some reflection on ethical considerations before you can really engage any other forms of analysis or, or study. Uh, and, and, and how has that been done in your courses? <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to our fourth and final prompt. Uh, and, and that will come from Dr. Deborah Dunn, who is a professor of communication studies at Westmont. Deborah has been one of the uh, co-founders and, and one of the leaders of an initiative within the city of Santa Barbara on uh, deliberation and dialogue, which is a program that helps people who are divided significantly about key issues uh, come together for conversation. So Deborah. Why they thought it would be a good idea that they did this very 
celebratory because Enrique makes it and he finds his mom and they thought it was a good thing, but they hadn't realized exactly what was wrong. Now they realize they were sorry. The thing that was interesting is then we had a really good discussion afterward, but I noticed that a lot of students were looking confused when they were apologizing because there were a lot of students who were who just thought it was fun. And so that became a learning moment for those students as well, as well. unfortunately, at the expense of the ones who were apologizing. So I think it became a teachable moment for the class, and, and it was great that the students eventually recognized their role and they were able to apologize. And I think uh, there weren't any hard feelings afterward, but it's not on the list for this year until I figure out how to do that. Thanks, Deborah. So, so I thought our prompt would be, can you think of any assignments that either you've created as a faculty member or experienced as a student uh, that misfired? <laughs> uh, that, or, or was counter, counter, yes, I hear there are a lot of empathy. So maybe discuss some things that uh, were counterproductive uh, that you would correct next time, so thanks. Let me thank all of you for your very uh, engaged and hearty participation in the conversation. It was great to uh, just hear the energy in the room around some of these topics. We do want to break now because uh, many of you want to uh, attend the, uh, the service that will include the presentation from Reggie Williams. And uh, Aaron is going to now come and give a few more instructions logistically. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. We are heading over to uh, Westmont's chapel service right now. Our speaker for that, some of you will have met uh, Reggie Williams, a theologian from McCormick Theological Seminary. Uh, his expertise is in European Christian encounters with African American Christianity, specifically uh, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer's uh, encounter with African American Christianity in the year that he spent in Harlem, uh, which significantly uh, changed his apprehension of what Christianity was about. Um, so I think we can expect a fairly direct and challenging message from uh, Reggie this morning in chapel. I would say that um, this is a Christian chapel service, kind of broadly in the non-denominational evangelical tradition, if there is such a thing. Um, for some of you, that will be uh, very familiar. You'll feel right at home. Uh, for others, that might not be your context or experience. Uh, I would invite you, if that's the case, to put on your sociologist hat uh, and join us and uh, figure out what we are doing in there and then report to us uh, what you see. We're very interested uh, in your perspectives uh, on our own context and tradition. Uh, that being said, uh, if you don't want to attend chapel, you're welcome to uh, spend this hour in conversation uh, or doing other things. In that connection, I would point to the best feature of our beautiful campus here. Uh, which is a walking trail that basically circumnavigates uh, campus. I've marked that uh, on your map. Any time that, especially those of you from colder climes, are feeling that we Californians are wasting this beautiful weather by sitting inside uh, for all of these sessions, uh, pop out for a few minutes uh, or more uh, and take a little bit of a walk on that trail. It really is beautiful. A little bit of wayfinding help. We have a devilishly difficult uh, campus to navigate. Uh, you may have already discovered. Um, heading over to chapel, you will not get lost. Uh, chapel is required on our campus, and therefore all traffic will flow like a funnel over to uh, the gym and carry you right along. Coming out of chapel, you won't have that advantage. Um, so those of us from the Gady Institute, uh, myself, Kristen, Kristen, are you here? Uh, Casey, uh, are going to be standing outside chapel ready to scoop you up uh, and take you to the concurrent sessions that will follow uh, chapel. Thanks very much, and we'll see you uh, in just a moment.